The first order of business for the two entrepreneurs was to find a customer for their product. But who would want to buy such a complex and delicate scientific machine? When Eckert and Mockley proposed to make a commercial venture out of building and selling electronic computers, a lot of people were very skeptical. And they raised a number of very interesting objections. The first one was that the machine was made out of large numbers of vacuum tubes. And these tubes were prone to burning out. In fact, uh, if you could keep one of these uh, machines running for a few hours before a vacuum tube burned out, you considered that great. But a worse problem was the machine's complexity. To make a computer do what you wanted was no easy task. You almost required an understanding of very advanced mathematics or logic to even get the computer to add two numbers together. And people felt that such a talent was so rare in the world that it didn't matter if you could mass produce the computers, you would never find enough people who had that skill to make them useful. Undaunted, Eckert and Morkley looked for a customer with a need so desperate that they'd be willing to take a gamble on the new technology. And they found it here. The US Census Bureau employed hundreds of clerks to process population data. They were drowning in records, with enough paper to fill a football field. They had a census coming up in a few years, and the time it took to process the census was getting longer and longer. And, it was, and they are mandated by Congress to get the census done in a certain length of time because elections are based upon it. And they were fearful that in the following election they wouldn't get done in time without something better than they had. The technology used for record keeping and accounting had been around since the turn of the century. Armies of clerks slaved away, punching data onto punch cards and then processing that information on other machines, which sorted the cards, added numbers on the cards and printed out results. But this whole tedious process and the clerks who operated it could be replaced by one single computer. Or so Eckert and Morkley tried to convince the Census Bureau. We thought it was magic. <laughs> We didn't believe it was really feasible to begin with. As we talked more and more with them, we came to believe that they knew what they were talking about and that they had already demonstrated uh, some important aspects of it in ENIAC. In September 1946, the first contract for a commercial computer was signed for the price of $350,270 and not a penny more. This footage, taken with John Mortley's home camera, gives an idea of the optimistic spirit in which this young company set out to found a new industry. They named their computer UNIVAC, for Universal Automatic Computer. But within a few months, Eckert and Mortley realized they had vastly underestimated the time and money their pioneering work would require. The company soon fell badly behind schedule and seriously into debt. It was a pattern the two inventors would repeat time and time again. They were terrific engineers and designers. They were not terrific business people. They had problems and uh, they gave us estimates and unfortunately we Unfortunately for them, in a sense, we made a contract with them, a fixed-place contract, to produce a UNIVAC, which ties us down legally. And uh, that wasn't enough money for them to produce a UNIVAC, nor was the time schedule enough. Uh, these are not criticisms. When you're doing developmental work like this, this is what uh, you expect to run into. But they hadn't anticipated enough of this kind of a problem. Alone in their field, Eckert and Morkley were inventing the future, and there were many unknowns. They spent considerable resources developing the electronic equivalent of boxes of paper files, storage devices like magnetic tape and tanks full of mercury. Charting this new territory took its toll on the company. After a year in business, the Eckert Morkley Computer Company was struggling to stay alive. They needed more investors, or at the very least orders with money up front to tide them over, and time was not on their side. Three and a half thousand miles away in London, 
Britain's computer industry was just beginning. It was one of the most extraordinary episodes in computer history. The J. Lyons Company was famous at the time for its string of tea shops and the celebrated Lyons corner houses. It was also a large-scale food manufacturer and distributor, employing more than 30,000 people and handling 40,000 orders a day. Strange as it seems, it was this company, famous for tea and cakes, which would start Britain's commercial computer industry. You had in the senior management of the office in Lyons some extremely far-sighted people with a, a considerable mathematical background. So it wasn't any surprise, really, that when they heard about these giant brains in the British newspapers, they thought to themselves, this is something we must investigate. After the war, Lyons was desperate for a better way to streamline its growing operation and keep track of its thousands of employees and products. What Lyons needed was a computer. But in 1947, there was no computer to buy in London. So this innovative company decided to build its own. To learn how, they asked for help from Cambridge University, where a team led by Maurice Wilkes was at work on a computer. Wilkes was one of the few people who agreed with Eckert and Morkley's vision that computers had a place outside the laboratory, and he gladly accepted the challenge. They gave us a certain sum of money, I've forgotten how much it was, and the services of uh, a technician, or I suppose I would now call him an engineer, uh, to work with us. Well, he was a member of their staff. He'd been in the RAF, I believe. He'd come back after the war. And I think he told me once he was working on a most interesting project, um, a coin-operated machine for delivering sizz sizzling hot sausages. Thus began the British commercial computer industry. By the end of 1951, the work of 400 clerks had been taken over by Lyons Electronic Office, appropriately nicknamed Leo. Once Leo was up and running, its programmers began thinking up some novel tasks for it. In those days, the managers of the tea shops used to send in their orders for the next day. And sometimes it was necessary to alter the order um, according to the weather. Uh, they wrote a program that would take these orders and if the weather were going to turn hot it would reduce the amount of steak and kidney pudding and increase the amount of salads and that sort of thing. Very interesting program. Lyons Computer also took in work from other companies who soon wanted their own and asked Lyons to build them. So in 1954 the Lyons Company, purveyors of tea and pastries, added a new product line, computers. <laughs> The path of the American computer industry was not as smooth. By 1948, Eckert and Morkley had been in business two years and were still far behind schedule. While Presper Eckert worked feverishly building the Census Bureau's Univac, John Morkley searched for more customers to relieve their financial crisis. There were other contracts under negotiation, important Defense Department contracts. But inexplicably, negotiations always broke down. Apparently, the President and I now agree on the necessity of getting rid of communists. We apparently disagree only... In the anti-communist hysteria, Eckert and Morkley's wartime service to their country was forgotten. The company they had founded now became a victim of the witch hunt. Those were the days of McCarthyism in Washington. And their idea was to pull your security clearance and not even tell you why. So contracts you had lined up, customers you had lined up who were going to invest money in your projects just quietly pulled out and wouldn't tell you why. But this is why. In the early 1940s, John Morkley came under FBI suspicion. He'd attended a meeting of a scientific organization that, unknown to him, had a communist affiliation. This single event prevented him from obtaining security clearances needed to work on defense projects. It would take nearly a decade for John Morkley to clear his name, and he carried the resentment with him until his death in 1980. 